book? Exodus. Exodus chapter 19 begins with verse 9. Friends, I'd like to tell you we are truly living in the last days. There is a war going on against the Word of God today. And let's study that together. Exodus chapter 19, verse, begin with verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words, what, what did Moses say? He told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and do what? What does the word sanctify mean? To consecrate. God is about to speak the Ten Commandments here. So God wants His people to consecrate themselves or sanctify themselves. And then He says, Consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day for the day for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai do you understand what this means God is about to to speak his, the Ten Commandments uh, in the ear, hearing of the people but he told Moses that the people needs to consecrate themselves because God's word is holy now skip on down now to verse 14 and Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctify the people, and they wash what? Their clothes. They wash their clothes, and he said unto them, unto the people, verse 15 now, Be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp, what? Tremble. And, the, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the neither part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount, what happened? Quake greatly. So God again is, is coming down on top of Mount Sinai, what, what was the reason? He's about to give them the Ten Commandments law. He's about, he did not just wrote the law on two tablets of stone, but he's about to spoke them. The Bible tells, it tells us that God spoke things into existence. So the Word of God, uh, it, there's life in the Word of God. The Word of God is very precious. But again, like, as I said, there's a war going on today on the Word of God, both in the world and and in the church. Now let's go to Deuteronomy. Do you know what the book Deuteronomy means? It means the repetition of the law or the second law. That's what the book Deuteronomy means. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Where are we going? Deuteronomy chapter 5. So Moses now is repeating the law that was given in chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. Deuteronomy chapter 5. We begin looking at verse, verse 4. And to the Lord talk with, with you face, face to face in the mount of the midst of the fire. This is what we just read in chapter 19. I stood between the Lord, that's Moses, I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the, the what? The word of the Lord. For you were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up in the mount saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of what kind of house? From the house of bondage. We've been studying this for the past few weeks now. From the house of bondage or house of sin or house of slavery or from this world. Verse 7. Thou shalt not, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The very first commandments there says, We shall not have any other gods before me. You can continue reading this, both here and also in Exodus chapter 20. This is where you find the Ten Commandments. But now, I'd like to draw your attention to verse 13. It says, Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. 
thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maidservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy ax, nor thy ass, nor thy not, nor any of the, thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gate, that thy maidservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. Now pay attention very closely to verse 15 now. Now remember, Deuteronomy, the word Deuteronomy means what again? It's the repetition of the law that we find in Exodus chapter 20. Now Moses is paraphrased the law there, and more specifically the Sabbath law there, the last part of it, of what God says here back in Exodus chapter 20. He says in verse 15, And remember that thou wast what? Servant. The word servant there, next to the word servant, you can put slave. They were slave. They were slave in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand, referring to the ten plagues, through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to what? To keep the Sabbath. What does Sabbath mean? It means rest. So you see the contrast there. Moses said, you were slave in Egypt. God brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and now He commanded you to rest. Do you see that? Did you see that? He command, you were in slavery. Do you rest when you're in slavery? But God brought them out of Egypt. Moses says, God brought you out of slavery and now commanded you to rest. On the Sabbath. That's what the word Sabbath means. Take a break from, from, from everything that you've been doing throughout the week. God says, rest. But today, man is telling us, no, this is not the day you should be resting on. There's a different day. There is a war, in, an open war on the Word of God. And this has go, been going on since time begins. With the rebellion of, of Lucifer. Now this rebellion is taking place right here on this earth. God says, don't change the word. We don't change the word. And I go to same book, Exodus, uh, Deut uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 4 now. We're looking at verse 2. Deuteronomy ch chapter 4, verse 2. Are you there? Amen? It says, Ye shall not while add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. What did God say? Don't take away anything from the word. Don't add to it either. Because why? Go to Proverbs. Uh, well, let's keep reading. Uh, look at a few more verses there. It says, your eyes have seen that the Lord did because of Baal Peor for all the men that follow Baal Peor. The Lord thy God have destroyed them from among you. So the Bible is saying that God's, you've seen the evidence. You see how God has taken, delivered you from Egypt. God says, now I'm giving you my word, which is life to your soul. If you live by them, you shall live, the Bible says. Now notice what it also says. In Proverbs 30. Let's go to Proverbs. Proverbs 30. Going towards the middle of the Bible. Proverbs is right after the book of Psalm. If you find the book of Psalm, which is towards the middle of the Bible, then after that it is the book of Proverbs. We're going to Proverbs chapter 30. And the first verse we're looking at here is verse 6. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 6. Are you there? Amen? And, it, and, and the Bible says... <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5 rather every word of the, uh, every word of who? of God every word of God is pure remember what uh, uh, Moses says don't add to it don't take anything out of it now Proverbs is telling us uh, so uh, Solomon is telling us that every word of God is pure he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him Add thou not unto his words, same counsel here, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a what? A liar. Solomon says, do not add unto God's word, lest God reprove you and you found yourself a what? A liar. Now go to Second Peter. Second Peter 1, Second Peter chapter 1. Now we go to the New Testament. 
Second Peter chapter 1, towards the end of the Bible. So God says that, Solomon says, the word of God is what? Is pure, right? The word of God is pure. You don't add to it. You don't take away from it. It's enough for us. And we don't have to temper with it. Second Peter chapter 1, verse, begin with verse 11 here. It says, For so entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance. Always in remembrance of what? In remembrance of the word of God. That's what Peter is referring to here. In remembrance of the word of God, of these things, though ye know them and be established in what? In the present truth. What's another word for present truth? That's the word of God. The word of God is present truth. That's what you and I need in these last days. We need the present truth. We need the word of God to make it in these last days. The, there's stories out there of the world answers. They, what they did during the dark ages, they not only studied the word of God, but they memorized the word of God. Because it was food to their soul. It was precious to them. Because they were living at a time when it was illegal to possess a Bible. You see, I don't think that we're going to have the same thing happen in this, in a global scale. Like when the Bible will be confiscated, although that might happen here and there. But I don't think this is going to happen on a global scale. You know how the war is being waged right now against the Word of God? It's not going to be confiscation of the Word of God from you. It's the corruption of the Word of God. And we'll get to that. Amen. It's a corruption. Verse 13. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, that's his body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. To stir you up. With what? With what the Word of God says compared to the what's popular in the day. Because what God says is not as popular as what's popular in these days. And so when you hear the plain teaching of the truth of the Word of God, it's going to stir people up. And listen to what this says here. Preachers should have no scruples to preach the, the what? The truth. As it is found in God's Word. Not as men is corrupting it today, but as it is found in God's word. Let the truth do what? Cut. Isn't that what Paul says in Ephesians? The word of God is like a two-edged sword, right? It cuts. Let the truth cut. But how does it cut you? How does the truth cut, uh, cut you? It will lead you to repentance or it will condemn you, right? That's how it cuts you. It's a two-edged sword. Remember that? I have been shown that why ministers have not, not more success is they are afraid of hurting feelings, fearful of not being courteous, and they lower the standard of truth and conceal, if possible, the peculiarity of our faith. So you have all these mega churches. What they do, they preach a, a prosperity gospel. They hear the word of God, the plain truth of the word of God from the massive because they give them what they, they tell them what they want to hear. They don't want to tell them words that would cut them to the heart that would lead them to repentance because it's, it's not really about bringing people to the kingdom. It's about a different agenda. It says, I saw that God could not make such successful. Successful how? Well, when you look at these mega churches, they have thousands of people, some of them. Is that, is that how God counts success? That's not how God counts success. It's not, the, uh, it's not the quantity, it's what? It's the quality. And it says, the truth must be made pointed and the necessity of a decision urged. And as false shepherds are crying peace and are preaching smooth messages... The servants of God must cry aloud and spare not and live the what? The results or what? The consequences with God. You remember John the Baptist? What kind of message did, did God gave John the Baptist to preach? It was a message of repentance to prepare a people for the, for the first advent. Meaning 
the first coming of Jesus Christ. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is a message today you don't hear often in most churches, not, in, not even in Adventist churches. Let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Going backward from, from 1 Peter to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, this will be the condition of, of, the, of the world in these last days. The Bible said, tells us that there will be a famine in the land. And in the, it's a famine over what? It's not over food, the Bible says. It's a famine of the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee, therefore, Paul is talking to Timothy. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Do what? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exalt, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. What does that mean? What is Paul saying? Paul says that you cannot add to the word. You cannot remove from the word. The word, God is old fashioned. That's what he means when he says that. Right here, preach the word, be instant in season. It doesn't matter what time it is. It doesn't matter which culture. The same truth needs to be preached. You, you don't cut away from the word of God. You don't diminish the word of God to accommodate the culture in those days. And isn't that what we're doing today? We are accommodating uh, the LGBT community. We are accommodating the, uh, this a feminist movement. We are accommodating this uh, movement for so that we can ordain women as as pastors. When the Bible doesn't say anywhere where you could do that. And then it goes on to say in verse three, here's the reason why: for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. What's sound doctrine? It's the word. It's the word of God. What's sound doctrine? They will not endure it, but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fa uh, fables. So they'll still be using the Bible. That's why Paul says they'll still be using the Bible, but they will stay away from the three angels' messages. They will stay away from messages that will turn the heart to God. They would tell them what they want to hear. And then many of them will be lost as a result. It is a sad reality, wouldn't you say? Now go to uh, backward now uh, to the chapter before that, Second Timothy, still in Second Timothy chapter 3. And then listen to what the Word of God will do to someone when it's being preached by preachers in the way that it should be preached. Listen to what uh, Paul says to Timothy in chapter 3. Paul says in verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a childhood, from child, that has known the holy scriptures, which are what? Able to make thee wise unto what? Unto salvation. Through faith which is in, in Christ Jesus. So, and then he says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? In righteousness. Now notice verse seven, 17, that the man of God or the woman of God may be what? Perfect, through, truly furnished unto all good, good works. So preach the word. In season and out of season, doesn't matter what time it is. We need to preach the word as it is found in the word of God, as it is found in Christ, to call people to repentance. As I said before, the word of God has been under scrutiny, is under fire. People are making war over the word of God. And this is not something that's happening in the world. This is happening even within the church. Listen to this article here. It says, new Bible versions remove Father and Son of God because it what? It offends Muslims. What, what did I say? New Bible versions remove Father and Son of God because it offends Muslim 
quoting them. It says, some midline Christian organizations are changing their holy scripture to avoid offending Muslims. Not only does this violate their scripture, but it also defeats the purpose of their mission to share the gospel. If mainline Christian organizations fear Muslims so much that they have to edit what they believe to, to be the word of God, how far can they be from submission? So we tempering with the word of God, we moving things that offend a certain group of people, the culture, and this is, this is what's happening. What did Paul says? Preach the word in season and out of, the, out of season. Because these people in the Muslim religion, they need to hear the word as well. And that will bring them to repentance as well. And listen to what uh, the book of Isaiah says. Isaiah, we're going to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 55. What, what book did I say? Isaiah 55. Let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 55 verse Verses 6 through 11, it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wild, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous men his thought, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have, what? Mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, my, your ways, my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For what? For as the, as the rain, listen now, for as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now, pay attention to verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which it I please, and it shall prosper in the thing there, thereto I sent it. So when you're removing words from the Bible that you think that, are, that offend certain group of people, you're saying that God is a liar, basically, because the Bible says that my word will accomplish what, what I designed it to do. Because there's life in the word of God. God says you don't change it. That's what the children of Israel, Moses told the children of Israel. You don't add to the word of God. You don't change it. But now we, we're moving words. And this has been happening <laughs> for years now. See, the, the, during the Dark Ages, the, the church, in the, the Roman church, made war against those who wanted to stick with the Word of God. They persecuted them, persecuted them physically. They made war against them. But you know what? Satan has been more effective in coming up with all of these corrupted Bible versions than, than in the time past. When he made physical war against the, the, the truth, against the word, the word of God. So let's look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. Well, you don't need to go there. For the sake of time, don't go there. In Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 29. This is where you read about the demons. When Jesus came to them. The, the, uh, this certain individuals who were possessed by demons. And Jesus came uh, came. To, uh, he was about to cast out the demon. Even the demons confessed that he was the son of God. Even the demons confessed that Jesus was the son of God. But now we're removing the son of God from the Bible because we don't want to offend Muslims. It's, 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 a, it's a sad reality. You remember in Matthew 4, what Jesus says? Well, let's, let's, let me take you to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. You're very familiar with that passage. Let's look at Matthew 4, beginning in verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hunger. And when the temper, tempter came, that's the devil, to him and said, If thou be, what's the first word there? If. If. Putting doubt in. Christ's mind, if thou be the Son of God. 
If you are truly the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. What does bread represent in the Bible? The word of God. Now think about it. Maybe you never thought of this before. Maybe you never dwell upon this passage like this before. The devil says what? If you are truly the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. The word made that could, you could use change. Change into bread. And the bread represents what? The word of God. The devil was basically saying to Jesus to change the word of God. Have you ever thought of it that way? Made these stones to be, uh, change this stone into bread. And bread represents what? The word of God. The devil was trying to tell Jesus to go contrary with what the word of God says. And what did Jesus say in verse 4? But he answered and said, It is written, Men shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of uh, the mouth of God. Jesus didn't take away anything from what Moses said. He was quoting Moses here in Deuteronomy chapter 8. That's where he was quoting from, Deuteronomy chapter 8. He didn't take away from what Moses said. He didn't add to what Moses said. But the devil wanted him to change what Moses said. Did you, did you catch that? The devil wanted him to change what the word says. And so that's what we're doing today. We're taking away what God has said. As if we have more wisdom than God. Listen to Psalm 89. Go to Psalm chapter 89. Psalm 89. It says... My covenant, God says. Listen, are you there? My covenant will I not break, nor what? Nor offer the thing that is what? Gone out of my lips. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus didn't rely on his own words whenever he was tempted, whenever he was faced, a different group of culture or people, he quoted from the word of God. It says here again, my covenant will I not break. What's the covenant for, uh, uh, by the way? That's the Ten Commandments. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Now listen to this here. You may know this person, Dwight Nelson. What did he say? Now remember what we just read in the previous article there. It says, that they are changing, removing Father and Son of God because we don't want to offend Muslims. But what are we teach, uh, teaching today? Pastor Dwight Nelson says, Allah is God. And that Allah is the God of the universe. There was an uproar all over the internet over this. There were Adventist folk uh, asking questions. Why is this man still preaching? Yes, he's an Adventist preacher. If you go on, on, on Google, you can Google this. There are Adventist folks asking, why is this man still preaching? And this comment was made back in 2011. My friend, Allah is not the God you and I worship. Even the Muslim will tell you that. Even the Muslim will tell you that we do not worship the same God. And that's the reason why they persecute Christians. Because they don't believe we worship the same God. But this man stand in at Andrews University, in our seminary, and says that Allah is God. And that's not even all. Uh, all. And listen to this one. Seventh-day Adventist Bible study discussion, SabbathSchool.net, April 4th through 10th. That's a Sabbath school lesson. The title of the lesson was Baptism and the Temptations. It says... Scholars put all these historic personalities together and give us a date close to A.D. 27 or 28 for the start of ministry of John the Baptist and Jesus. It is within the historical time frame of these Roman Empire luminaries that Jesus was baptized. Do you understand what, what this is saying? I'll explain it. Here's what this is saying. They were commenting on the event that took place when Jesus was baptized with John, uh, starting with John ministry. So they're putting that now on which date John started his ministry and also which date Jesus was anointed. 
Do you understand what that means? I don't think you, you, under, you, you, you get the significance of what this is saying. Let me take you to the book of Luke. Let me take you to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 3. Go to Luke chapter 3. If you think this is something small, you have no idea how big this is. Luke chapter 3. It says, if you have any doubt about when exactly Jesus or John the Baptist started his ministry or Jesus was anointed, go to Luke chapter 3. And then study history, it tells you exactly around what time. It says in Luke chapter 3 verse 1, Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the Bible is giving you dates here. It's telling you when so and so occupied this office or that office, so that you know without a shadow of a doubt when John the Baptist started his ministry, when Jesus was anointed. Listen again. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and of the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest. The, and then it says, The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, and I, I, Zacharias in the wilderness, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of what? Repentance for the remissions of sins. This was pro prophesied. The exact date that this was going to happen. That John the Baptist, God was going to raise a person that Isaiah described it as one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. But in Daniel, we'll look at Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, it says specifically when the Messiah will be anointed. So, you, you know why this is dangerous? Because around this time, there were many messiahs, many false messiahs. So that means if you're putting that or it's saying around AD 26, around AD 27, around AD 28, that means any of these so-called messiahs could be the one. Go to Daniel, the book of Daniel. Again, back to Luke, what we just read there. Luke gives you a chronological order here. It tells you who was governor here, governor there, governor there. It gives it. Luke was giving you the date. And then it says the word of God came to John when these individuals occupied this office and that office. It's, it is very plain. It is very clear. There's no reason to put doubt on this. Go to Daniel. Daniel, well, before we go to Daniel chapter 9, let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Look, we'll look at one verse there as a little bit of background. It says in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, And he said unto me, You remember John, uh, the angel Gabriel came to Daniel and then uh, shared a vision with him? This is a, the longest time prophecy in the Bible, the 2,300 years prophecy. And it says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now a day in the Bible prophecy represent a year. So it's not a literal 2,300 uh, days, it's a 2,300 years. But we know, from, according to the book of uh, Ezra, this, this time prophecy began in 557 BC. Amen? 557 BC. Now notice, going to Daniel chapter 9 now, in Daniel chapter 9, Notice what the angel said. Now, just a little bit of background. Daniel did not understand the vision. And then the angel came back, the angel Gabriel came back to give him understanding. He did not understand the time prophecy. The angel came back and told him what was going to happen within that, that prophecy there. And then it says in verse 24, listen, now, this time prophecy, this longest period of time prophecy, the 2,300 years prophecy, had another time prophecy within it. And then you find that in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. You remember Daniel's people, including Daniel, were in captivity in Babylon because of their sin. Because they sinned against God. God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come and 
take them to captivity, right? Now God says, I'm going to give them one more chance. And then he says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, that's Jerusalem, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to what? What's the next phrase there? And to anoint the, the most holy. Who's the most holy? Who's that? That's Christ. That's when he was anointed. So how much time did God say? 70 weeks. So what would happen towards the end of that 70 weeks? They should expect the Messiah. Because God detailed everything that would, that, that were to, to be done during the 70 weeks. So from 457 BC, now let's keep reading before I get to that. Verse 25. Now therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, to restore and to build Jerusalem, that's 557 BC. Next to your Bible, if you take note, you can put 557 BC next to that here. When it says, now therefore, understand that from the going forth of the commandment, to restore and to, re and to build Jerusalem. 557 BC, that's when, 457 BC. Sorry, I, 457 BC. You can put that there. And then it says, the Messiah, that's the anointed one, the Messiah, the prince, shall be 70 weeks and three score and two weeks. Do the math quickly. So within the 70 weeks, the angel says they shall be what? Seven weeks. Why seven weeks? Because they, they were going to go, they had seven weeks to go back and to start rebuilding their country. They had seven, uh, seven years. Going back and we build a country, that's the seven weeks there. And then it says, and three score, what's three score? 60. That's 20, three times 20. Three times 20, that's, that's 60. And three score and two weeks. So add all of it together, you have what? 69 weeks. So do you see how the Bible gives, give a specific date on what, what was going to happen? God says here that there will be 69 weeks and at the end of that 69 weeks, the Messiah will be anointed. Isn't that what we just read? Around that time, the Messiah. That was very specific. Now, what would you put doubt on that? So if you count from 557 BC, I keep saying 500, 457 BC, I don't know why. 457 BC to AD 27. How long is that? How many years is that? How many years is that? From 457 to AD 27. We, you remember, there's no year zero. BC goes down and, and then AD goes up. You, see, you count a 2 BC, 1 BC, and then you you go to 180 and it goes up. So how many years is that that have gone by? That's the 69 weeks he's referring to because he says the Messiah will be anointed. <laughs> different math. No, it is a different math. How long did they have? 70 weeks. 70 weeks equals what? 490 days, which is 490 years. God gave them 490 years. So yeah, it is 483 years. It is 483. So now they have another seven days or seven years. Remember, a day for a year. So that tells us specifically when the Messiah would come. And then we read, we read about it in the gospel that Jesus was anointed by John the Baptist. Now when you put that, when you put doubt on that, you're putting doubt on not only who the Messiah really is, you're putting doubt on 1844 when the sanctuary was cleansed because if we don't, if we're not sure the date that Jesus was anointed, that we don't, we, we're not sure that what took place in 1844 really happened when the sanctuary was cleansed, that Jesus now is in the most holy place. Now we are living in the time of the investigative judgment. So we're putting doubt on, in all of this, this is not something small. It is not small. 
It is big. It is the pillars of our foundation. You're putting also doubt on spiritual prophecy. Because we're not sure exactly when he was uh, anointed. There's an open war on the word of God, my friend, my brothers and sisters. Both on the outside and within, within the church. Listen to what this says here. In his word, God has committed to men the knowledge necessary for what? Salvation. For salvation. The Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of His will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrine, and the test of experience. And since it was the Spirit of God, listen, and since it was the Spirit of God that inspired the Bible, it is impossible that the teaching of the Spirit should ever be contrary to that of the Bible. Do you understand what this is saying? The same thing Jesus says in the book of John. Jesus says, I will send you the comforter and he will not speak his own word. He will speak what I tell him to speak. That means even the spirit of God cannot go contrary to the word of God. But we are removing stuff from the word of God. We're going contrary. Even the spirit of God cannot teach you something contrary that's already written here. And then it says, the spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed to succeed, supersede the Bible. For the scriptures explicitly state that the word of God is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. That's from the great controversy. Go to Psalm 119. Listen, again going back towards the middle of the Bible, Psalm 119. We're looking at verses 9 through 16. Psalm 119, are you there? Amen? Okay, Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. It says, Wherewith all shall a young man cleanse his way? That's a question David is asking here. By taking heed uh, thereto according to thy word. So he answered it. According to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from, my, from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid where? Have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against, against thee? Are we feeding on the word of God? We, we eat food for what reason? To sustain us, right? To keep, to, uh, to, keep us, to keep us going. But David says here that I want the word of God to be in my heart so that I might not. Sick. What does, what's another word you can use here for, uh, I mean, sin? Sickness. If we eat the right food, right, we'll be healthy, right? At least we hope, right? So, but David says, now, I, this sickness, the only thing that can cure, that can keep me healthy, is the word of God. And that sickness is sin. It's sin. And he goes on to say, listen now. He says, <clears throat> In verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statute. I will not forget what? Thy word. I will not forget thy word. Go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, going back to the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. What book did I say? 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 2. Amen? And we're looking at verse uh, 17. It says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God. Speak we in Christ. What's the next few things he says? He says, For we are not as many which do what? Corrupt the word of God. And this is what we're studying about. The word of God has been corrupted. Listen to what this says here. In the Adventist fundamental beliefs, they're proposing a change to the fundamental beliefs that's coming in this summer in Texas. So now what they're doing, they're removing words that's, that's, uh, word, they, they wanna, what they call, what do they call it? Inclusive language. So, let me read and then we'll, you'll see what 
what they're doing. The Holy Scriptures, this is fundamental number one, the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures, all the New Testament, are the written Word of God, given by divine inspiration. Now, the words in red are the ones that they adding. The words that are underlined are the words that they removing. Okay, again, the inspired authors, that's what they are adding. Through holy men of God, that's what they are removing. Why? They want to replace it with persons of God who spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In this word, God has committed to removing men, humanity. Why are they doing this? It says over there, inclusive language. Because they have an agenda... They don't want to offend people. They want to show that the Bible, when it comes to ordin uh, 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 women ordination, that it could be both men and women. So they're removing words that they think will, might offend some people. It's the same thing we just read in the beginning, in the previous slides, a slide. It's the same thing. They're removing these holy men. That's what Peter says. Peter says, holy men of God. What, what's wrong with, with keeping holy men of God? That's what the Bible says. It, it's, not, it's not about an attack on women. It is a fact the Bible says there, 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 were, there were not women authors. But now they were moving, say, persons. Even where it talks about God as a, as a he, they were moving that. Or Christ as a man, they're removing that. It's an open war. And listen, listen to the uh, next article here. See who's really behind all, the, all of this. It says in, the, in this book, Rulers of Evil. In 1964, Pope Paul VI amplified Miranda process with the decree in term which means among the wonders, saying it is the churches, that's the Roman Catholic, birthright to use and own the press, the cinema, radio, television, and others of a like nature. Why do you think all this entertainment that's keeping you from studying the Word of God for yourself to know it for us, where do you think they're coming from? This is where they're coming from. Listen now. The faculty of Munich College praised the way Jesuit theater captivated Protestants, especially the parents of school-age youngsters, there is no, quoting now, there is no better means of making friends out of heretics. Why are they calling heretics? Protestants. Those who want to stick with the Word of God, the Bible and the Bible only. There, there, are, there is no better means of making friends out of heretics and the enemies of the church, that's the Catholic Church, and fulfilling the enrollment of the school, then good what? High-spirited, playartic. What does that mean? Movies, entertainments, they give you these things to occupy your mind so that you, don't, you won't have time to study the Word for yourself. That's the reason why they invented entertainment. That's what you're reading about. Moving on. The, it says, doing its four centuries of existence, the Jesuits, that's a Catholic, education theatrical enterprise has produced a proud, poised, and imagine, imaginative graduate. He or she is enlightened by the medicine libraries of humanities, facile in worldly matters, moved by theatrical, uh, theatrically, and indifferent toward what? Toward the Holy Scripture. So they use entertainment, they occupy themselves with Entertainment tonight, they became indifferent towards what the Word of God says. It says, producing Jesuitic graduates has become the aim of modern public education. Despite the heavy price of ignoring this Bible, ignoring the Word. Jesuit theater and the spiritual exercises, whose original purpose was to bring human understanding into what? Into PayPal subservient through esoteric emotional experiences. That movies that you go to the movie theater, you come out, you feel so emotional, you feel like you are part of it. And then you, when you go home, you won't open this, this bike because it's, it's not as, as excited of what you've been watching. And it says, have evolved into the full 
panoply of contemporary social communication. It goes on to say, after World War II, during September 1957, Pope John Paul XIII uh, gave Jesuit theater even broader horizons with his encyclical one Miranda pro process, looking ahead, saying men must be brought into closer communion with one another. Sounds pretty good, right? What are they doing to bring men closer to it? Entertainment. They must become socially minded. These technical art, cinema, sound broadcasting, and television can achieve this aim far more easily than the printed word. You know what they're referring to as the printed word? The Bible. And the Catholic Church is keenly desirous that these means be con converted to the spreading and advancement of everything that can be truly called good. Entertainment. Entertainment. Go to John. John chapter 6. Let me show you something there. Maybe you never saw it this way. John chapter 6. There's a group of people who are following Jesus, not because of the truth, not because of the word, but because of entertainment, because of the miracle. Listen to what it says in John chapter 6. Are you there? John chapter 6, beginning in verse 30. It says, Then said there, therefore unto him, What sign, these people came to Jesus, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? They, they wanted to see what? A sign, some kind of entertainment so they could be like, wow, yeah, yeah, give us more. He is truly the Messiah. Our fathers, they say, did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus says unto them, verily, verily, I say unto, thee, unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven, who's the true bread? Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the true bread. But did they want to hear that? The, the Messiah was here. The true bread was here. The word that became flesh was here. But they wanted what? Show us a sign. They wanted entertainment. And then it says, verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus says, I am all. I am sufficient. I am the word. But they wanted something more. Something that would entertain them. Now, skip on down now to verse 65. Did, did, they, did they accept this? Did they, did they want to accept Jesus as the word, as the Messiah, as the bread? Listen, verse 65. And he said, therefore, uh, said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him by of my Father. Now listen, verse 66. For the, that, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter and said him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast what? The words of what? Eternal life. So notice what verse 66 says. They did not want to hear this. Jesus didn't want to perform the miracle. Jesus didn't want to entertain them with what they wanted to entertain themselves. Therefore, they say, we, we don't wanna have, want to have anything to do with this. And this is what's happening today. We want the movies. We want to be entertained by, by Hollywood. And we're becoming dumb to what the Word of God is teaching us. So the people came to Jesus for the entertainment. They did not want to hear the Word. And then this is the same time that we're living at as well, listen to what, ha uh, what it says here in Desire of Ages, page 392, in regard to this group of people who did, not, who, who did not want to hear what Jesus had to say, and then they stopped following Jesus. He said, their decision was never afterward reversed. What decision was that? They, they did not want to walk with him anymore. For they walked no more with Jesus. This was one of the times of purging. 
by the words of truth, the chaff was being separated from the wheat. Because they were too vain and self-righteous to receive reproof, too world-loving, that's the entertainment they wanted, to accept a life of humility, many turn away from Jesus. Many are still doing the same thing in our days. Souls are tested today as were those disciples in the synagogue of Capernaum. When truth is brought home to the heart, they see that their lives are not in accordance with the will of God. They see the need of an entire change in themselves, but they are not willing to take up the self-denying work. Therefore, they are angry with their sins. When their sins are discovered, they go away offended, even as the disciples left Jesus, murmuring, this is what? A hard saying, who can hear it? And this is not popular today to preach within Christianity. We like the uh, popular gospel, the uh, uh, what is called, what is being called today, a uh, social gospel, but not the everlasting gospel. Let's make this applicable now. What are we struggling with? What are you struggling with? That you find that that's too precious to give up for Jesus. That you know what the Word of God says. Jesus says, I, I am the bread. I can give you victory over this particular sin in your life. But we are holding it in and misusing God's grace and thinking that we have time. The Bible says that today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Today, because tomorrow what? It's not promise. So some murmur about diet reform, health reform, and all of these things. Even the straight testimony. Everything is being, is being under attack today. Satan has accounted it for every truth of God. Listen to what this says here. In Testimony, volume 5, pages 135 and 136. The promise is, Jesus says, Them that honor me, I will honor. How do you honor Christ? By obeying Him. By, by saying, Lord, I know this is a sin, but I'm going to honor you. I want to have victory over this. I'm going to take your, uh, your word for it. And I'm going to honor you. Now is the time for God's people to show themselves true to what? To what you believe. Whether we, we believe in, we profess to be uh, historical Adventists. Of, uh, Adventists from the conference churches. Is by honoring God, by doing His will. That's what's going to save you. Being a part of a historical Adventist church will not save you. It says, when the religion of Christ is most what? Held in contempt. When his law is most what? Despised. Then should our zeal be the, the warmest and our courage firmness the most unflinching. And then it says, to stand in defense of what? Of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. The majority will forsake you. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be what? Our test. This will be your test and my test. Because true Christianity, true Seventh-day Adventists will not be popular in these last days. We are told it is a remnant. It is a small group. It is a little band within Adventism that's going to make it. And then it says, at this time, we must gather what? Warm from the coldness of others and courage from their cowardice and loyalty from what? From their, from their trees, from their treason. Why? As I mentioned a few moments ago, Pastor Dwight Nelson, I have great respect for him, but to stand at our university and to, and to say that Allah is God and for me to stand here and others that have done this, to say that that's wrong. Do you know how many people are going to go against me for saying this? Plenty. That's right. It says here, Gospel Workers, 1915, page 100. In the great conflict before us, he who would keep true to Christ must penetrate what? Deeper than the opinions and doctrines of men. How many people, when they heard this, how many, and this, this, is, this is all over the internet, and then millions of Christians and seven Advent, including seven Adventists, heard that message. How many of them picked up the, the Bible and studied the Bible for themselves and compared what this man says, that Allah is God, and said, oh no, he's wrong about this. 
They're not penetrating the Bible deeper than the opinions and doctrines of men. My message to ministers, young and old, is this. God what? Jealously, your hours for prayer, Bible study, that's the word, and what? And self-examination. And then it says here, I speak plainly. That's in first testimony, page 163. I speak first uh, plainly. I do not think this will discourage a, a true Christian. I do not want any of you to come up to the time of trouble. What? Without a world well-grounded hope in your Redeemer. How do you get a well-grounded hope? It's the Word. That's where you get a well-grounded hope. Determined to know what? The worst of your case. And the Bible will help you to see that. To see the worst of your case. As certain if you have an inheritance on high, deal truly with your own self. Remember that a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing will Jesus present to his Father. So how would you, how would taking words out of the Bible or adding words to the Bible will help somebody to be ready for the soon return of Jesus? It will not help a soul, a single soul. This, go to Proverbs. Proverbs, Proverbs 4. Where are we going? Proverbs chapter 4. Going to Proverbs chapter 4. Again, Proverbs is towards the middle of the Bible, right before the book of Psalm. I mean, right after the book of Psalm. Thank you.